Um, I'd like to kick the program off for today. I'm Jason Hartshew uh, with Ohio State University Extension. I work in dairy management and precision livestock. Uh, so today we're excited to have with us um, Dr. Tom Tabler. He is the Extension Poultry State Specialist uh, and Research Specialist with the University of Tennessee. Um, he's done work all of his life in poultry, uh, specifically from talking to him today, he's been doing some this work uh, both before he was at Tennessee, when he was at the University of Mississippi, uh, and has continued it on uh, cooling of poultry, and specifically what he's going to talk about today, which is sprinkler effects on cooling water use, litter moisture, and broiler house environment. Uh, I think you'll find this to be a really interesting presentation. Um, he sent me his uh, presentation as a PDF, and I put that in the chat. I'm going to redrop that in the chat once we get started, uh, if you want to open that and have a printer close and want to take notes um, so that you have that. I know sometimes the chat doesn't show up if it was sent before you log in. So I am going to post that again here shortly, um, and I will switch over and let Tom take it away and share what he's learned. All right, Jason, I appreciate that. I'm going to turn my camera off, folks, so you can kind of focus in on what I'm talking about and le less on me. But again, you know, I've I've played around with sprinklers for a good number of years now and at, at different sites. So I've been at the University of Arkansas at Mississippi State, and I'm now at the University of Tennessee. And I've kind of played around with sprinklers at all of these locations in terms of how they perform differently, but also similarly to cool cell systems in a commercial broiler house. So that's what we're going to talk about today is, is kind of some of what we've seen with sprinkler work. Well, if I can get it to do what I want it to do. Okay. All right. Has a little bit of an introduction. You know, poultry represented approximately 40% of the global meat production in the world in 2020. You know, poultry passed pork here a few years ago in terms of the, the number one meat protein source. Personally, I tend to think pork is going to have a very difficult time getting the number one position back, in part because broiler chickens are very efficient in terms of growth rate and feed conversion. They can beat what hogs can do. They can beat what cattle can do. And I think it's going to be very difficult for anybody else to, to take that number one global meat protein source away from the poultry folks. By far, feed is the largest contributor to climate change impact that is associated with broiler production. And climate change is a huge issue today, not just in the broiler industry, but across all of agriculture. In terms of what does it cost to produce a crop of feed? How much are farmers spending to plant and harvest in the terms of diesel fuel? How much water are they using to grow that crop if they're having to irrigate their corn or their soybeans? And all of these are things that people are looking at today that didn't quite attract as much attention, you know, five, 10 years ago as what it does today. And water shortage is a growing global concern, you know, throughout the world, not just in this country, but everywhere. Estimates are that by 2025, half the world's population is going to be facing at least some degree of water stress and worrying about where the water is going to come from. And in part because of that, sustainability in the poultry industry depends to a large part of, on an uh, available water supply. We're going to have to have water. And water scarcity is an increasing problem facing global agriculture, especially the livestock side of global agricultural production. Water conservation is a major emphasis for the poultry industry today as it does try to do a better job of becoming more sustainable. And that's what it's being asked to do from the folks that the chicken industry sells product to, whether that's Chick-fil-A, Buffalo Wild Wings, McDonald's, whoever, because their customers are asking them, basically, you know, what's the chicken industry doing to save the planet these days? Climate change and heat stress, heat stress certainly does challenge sustainability in terms of how we are going to continue to produce, especially broiler chickens in the future. Now, 
Most broiler houses today are equipped with cool cell systems and cool cell systems are very effective at keeping the house relatively cool, depending on what the house to, or the outside temperature happens to be. But cool cell systems do use large amounts of water. And, and as that house gets more and more humid, and again, if a cool cell system is working really well, you can keep the house 82, 83, 84 degrees, even if it's, a, if, even if it's 100 or higher outside, but it takes a lot of water to do that and it causes a humidity inside that house to be very high. You can keep it 82, 83 degrees, but you may have 85, 90, 92% humidity inside that house because it's gonna become very, very humid as you cool that house temperature down. Sprinkler systems operate in a little bit different you know, thought process in terms of how they cool chickens and they do offer cooling water conservation while also maintaining, or maybe even in some cases, improving production performance from the birds themselves. Sprinkling is different in that it kind of results in direct cooling of those individual chickens. So direct cooling can be achieved by sprinkling the surface of livestock or poultry with coarse water droplets. And, and the sprinkler system is a coarse droplet. It's not a fog, it's not a mist, it's actually a, a fairly large drop of water, like sprinkling rain when it sprinkles outside. It's a reasonably large drop of water. It's not a fog or a mist. And then you sprinkle water on those chickens and then evaporation occurs locally on that animal, assuming there's sufficient air movement to do that. You do have to have air movement down the house. And in most tunnel ventilated houses today, most folks do have anywhere from 500 to 800 cubic feet per minute of airflow. So there is a pretty good breeze blowing across those chickens whenever you've got your cool cells operating or whenever you have the sprinkler system, op system operating. It does require different thinking, however. You do have to think about cooling chickens differently with sprinklers than what you do with cool cells because sprinkling focuses on cooling individual chickens. It does not attempt to cool all the air in the house like cool cells do. Cool cells are kind of like air conditioning in your house. It cools the environment of that chicken house down. It cools the entire air in the house. Sprinklers do not try to do that. Sprinklers try to cool the individual chickens and it's two completely different thought processes. It does allow each individual bird though to do its own evaporative cooling. You know, chickens don't sweat, and we'll talk about that. Chickens have to kind of cool themselves and remove body heat by panting. And if the, the air they're breathing in is dry enough, they're better at doing that than what they are if the air inside the house becomes too humid. However, it does require accepting the fact that the house must run at a hotter temperature and a lower humidity. And that's very difficult for some people to accept and not try to panic before things get out of hand. And that does create challenges. It is challenging to incorporate sprinklers in the cool cell systems because integrators and growers both tend to panic a little bit when that house temperature starts to rise. You know, if you're used to an 82, 83 degree house temperature with your cool cell system, and all of a sudden that house temperature begins to go to 87, 88, 89, maybe even 90, a lot of people begin to panic because they're not used to seeing that hot a temperature in their chicken house. But house temperatures must increase for the sprinklers to be successful. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult to use sprinklers and make them work right. You know, it is going to be necessary to develop a management press strategy such that you have a set point at an application schedule that will achieve not only the cooling water savings that you're trying to accomplish with a sprinkler system, but also to make sure that you have satisfactory air and litter quality inside that chicken house. Now, sprinkling works with other livestock. Folks sprinkle cattle and hogs all the time, and it works well. There's no reason this same principle won't work with chickens. But again, the natural response of folks is you can't sprinkle water inside a chicken house. You're going to wet the floor, and the litter's going to be wet, and you're just going to have a big mess on your hands. But that's not the case if you manage it right, but you do have to manage it right. 
you know, sprinkler houses are going to be more comfortable than cool cell houses because the humidity is going to be lower, the litter is going to be drier, and the environment for that chicken in terms of it relieving its, its heat stress is going to be better if you manage the system correctly. Now, again, chickens do not sweat. So how do we get around that? What are we going to have to do? In-house temperature and the humidity inside that chicken house are critical to that chicken survival. It's not just the temperature. It's not just high temperatures or heat that kills chickens in the summertime. It's the combination of high temperature and high humidity that kills those chickens. Chickens can actually stand some fairly high temperatures if the humidity is low enough and they can still remove body heat by panting. So for them, a 60% in-house humidity level is much better than a 90% in-house humidity level because it's much easier for them to remove excess body heat by panting in the summertime. Cool cell houses, again, oftentimes you can keep those things 82 to 84 degrees regardless of what the outside temperature is, but you may have 90% humidity or higher inside that chicken house and that high humidity makes it very difficult for those chickens to cool themselves. Sprinklers, again, is, is a little bit different thought process because sprinklers provide artificial perspiration. You sprinkle some water on them and, and you, you put the sweat on the chicken. And then you use the fans and the wind chill effect to reduce cooling water use by over 50% when you use the three levels of cooling that are within the sprinkler system itself before you ever add any type of cool cell cooling. I don't think you can to totally eliminate cool cells with a sprinkler system. I don't think you can put a sprinkler system in and make the sprinkler system do all of the cooling, but you can certainly use it to your advantage to save a lot of water use that otherwise would go through cooling through those cool cell systems. I still think you're gonna to have to use your cool cells. You're just not gonna to have to use them near as much if you manage everything right. Again, chickens lose heat mainly through panting and directly applying water onto those chickens with sprinklers allows direct evaporation of the water off the bird's surface. And this absorbs heat directly from the body of the birds and the birds can also remove heat through panting if the humidity inside the house is low enough. But again, it requires keeping the humidity inside that house as low as you can which means letting the temperature inside the house go up. And again, when that temperature goes up, that scares a lot of growers and a lot of integrators because they're not used to seeing a high temperature. We've all become pretty spoiled of cool cells and we do begin to panic when the temperature begins to go up. Cool cells must be delayed though. You have to delay when you let your cool cells run if you're gonna be successful with using sprinklers. I tend to think there's there's no point in turning your cool cells on in a sprinkler house until that house temperature is at least 88 degrees. And again, that spooks a lot of people. And even when you turn your cool cells on, you do not want to turn them on long enough that they're going to wet the pad. You do not want to get the pad soaked to the point that it begins to lower the temperature inside the house and it makes the humidity begin to climb up. You just don't want it to go higher than that 88 degrees. You know, it may be 100 outside. You don't want it to be 95 or 98 in the chicken house. You just don't want it to be more than 88. But you also do not want to drop it down to 82 or 83 degrees because that's going to be too cool and too moist for that sprinkler system to be at its best. When you operate those pads at that 88 degrees, you know, operate them on temperature. Don't let them run on a timer. Operate them on temperature. When it gets 88 degrees, let them come on for a very short period of time. I would say maximum of 10 or 15 seconds, no longer than that. Because again, you don't want to wet the pad. You know, you'll have streaks in it. You'll be able to see streaks in your cool cell pad where there's a little bit of water running down the pad but you don't want to run it long enough that it wets the pad and that it starts to cool that house temperature down and raise the humidity level. 
If you only operate it on temperature and not on timer, and you only run it 10 or 15 seconds, you can have 20% or more lower humidity inside that chicken house. And that 20% lower humidity is going to make a huge difference in terms of cooling water savings. It's going to help your pads work better. They're going to last longer. And again, that lower humidity is going to make it easier for those chickens to breathe out that body heat they need to get rid of. Air temperature inside a sprinkler house is basically the same or maybe only a few degrees below what it is outside. And, and that's something that you do have to condition yourself to and, and get used to because it's not going to keep it cool like a cool cell house will. Humidity inside the house is going to be pretty similar to what it is outside, but that's going to consistency, consistently be lower than what the humidity inside a cool cell house is going to be. And sprinkler houses may operate warmer, but you're still got adequate cooling because you've got the direct evaporative heat loss from the feathers of those chickens and the increased respiration losses from the bird's lungs because you've got a lower humidity inside the house and it's easier for them to move excess body heat out of their body. It does take getting used to though. And, and this is a requirement. You have got to get used to the fact that the house has to run hotter, which will give you a lower humidity. As temperature goes up, humidity goes down. And that's what you've got to shoot for is a, is a house that's a little bit hotter than what you may be comfortable with but that will give you a lower humidity. And unless that house is allowed to run at a hotter temperature and a lower humidity, sprinkler systems are not going to perform the way they're designed to perform. When the house is hotter and drier than, than normal, than what you're used to, the sprinkle water evaporates in between the runs. The sprinklers don't run constantly. We'll talk a little bit about what the timing is on when they run, how often they run, how much they run here in a little bit. But you want to make sure that when it does run, the water has a chance to evaporate off of those chickens before it comes on and runs again. And if you keep the cool cells in the house on too much and you keep the house too cool and too humid, the water that you sprinkle on those chickens is not going to have time to evaporate in between runs and it's going to be too cool, too moist in that house, too humid, and you certainly can wet the floor if you don't manage it right. There's a lot of numbers on this slides and we're not going to go through all of these numbers here, but look at look at the very bottom line, the one in bold where it says average. So this was some very early experimental results when I was still at the University of Arkansas. This was back years before there was ever a commercial sprinkler system on the market. At that time, and, and this set of numbers runs from 1995 to 2005. So this is 10 years worth of summertime cooling data. Now, you'll notice that some of those years we have Two summer flocks, some of those years we only have one. For instance, 1995, we only had one summer flock. 1996, we had two summer flocks. But this is all the summer flocks we grew over that 10 year period. And the University of Arkansas had four commercial chicken houses that the school owned, that we was a contract grower for a, a local integrator in Northwest Arkansas. And this is some of our data back long before there was ever a commercial system out there because we had an ag engineer at that time that designed a system out of his head, a sprinkler system out of his head. And we used his homemade system basically in house two, and we use cool cells only in house four. Now look at that bottom line of, of average numbers across there. For house two, the cooling water, look at the first two columns, the cooling water that we used over those 10 years for the summertime flocks was roughly 5,000 gallons of water used in the sprinkler house. We used 34,000 gallons in the cool cell house. That was the average difference in how much water savings there was with sprinklers versus cool cells. You may wonder if, if it changed the drinking water of those chickens because the house was hotter. The sprinkler house was several degrees hotter than the cool cell house. But if you look at our water data, 
you know, it's basically the same. 43,108 gallons, 43,599 gallons was the average water consumption of those flocks. So even though house two, the sprinkler house was hotter, they really didn't drink any more water. Look at feed conversion. The next two columns over there, 195, 195 versus 197. The sprinkler house actually had better feed conversion than the cool cell house did. An average weight, the last two columns, 482 versus 477. We were growing a fairly small bird, but again, the sprinkler house had five points better weight than what the cool cell house did. So again, this was back even before there was actually an official commercial system on the market. We were, we were just playing around with it at the time. It was experimental. It was designed by Dr. Ivan Berry, who was in the Ag Engineering Department at the University of Arkansas at that time, that worked with me a lot at the chicken houses. Ivan has long since passed away now, but he basically fought this thing up out of his head. And he used the Campbell Scientific CR10 data logger for his controller. Again, something he just you know, dreamed up out of his head and knew how to do from his ag engineering expertise. The picture on the right, that's what it looked like. It was winched. There were three lines of sprinklers. They were all on winches. We could raise them up and down. And usually when we were running them, we set them at about chest height and let it sprinkle water on the chickens, similar to what the commercial system does today. But it, it was just some, some PVC pipe and his... CR10 data logger and that little black spinner head on drops that were every 20 feet up and down that line throughout the whole length of the house. Now, today it's a little bit different. There is a commercial system available on the market that is, is somewhat similar to what Ivan kind of put together out of his head. Actually, the people that have the commercial system today visited with Ivan on several occasions and, and they took a lot of what he told them he was doing and how he put his programming and everything together and incorporated it into, into their system. But there is a commercial system out there today that has now been used for several years. And it's the system that we work with, that I've used at Arkansas, that I've used at Mississippi State. It does consist of two to three lines. These are stationary in the ceiling. They're not on winches, so they stay in the ceiling all the time. But it's two to three lines. It does have its own independent control system, that little blue box there on the bottom left, that's its controller. So it does have its own separate controller. So the house controller, your chicken house controller, does not know that the sprinkler controller is in the house because the two systems do not communicate with each other. So you kind of have to set your set point for your cool cell on your house controller to match what you want it to do based on what you've got your sprinkler controller set to do, because again, the two do not communicate with each other. Acceptance was pretty slow on this system in the beginning. It's gotten a lot better over the last two or three years, because again, water savings has become a lot bigger issue here lately than what it was, you know, five, six, seven years ago. So it is catching on more so, but again, it does sprinkle large drops of water. It's not a fog or a mist. It's actually a sprinkle. And there is a fair amount of data out there today for anyone that's interested in sprinkler type data that was not out there 10 years ago because there's been enough schools and enough institutions working on it that there's getting to be a fairly decent data set out there today. This is some of the work that, that I did when I was still at Mississippi State that kind of gives you an idea of what it's like. This is work from Arkansas. I work with all these folks at Arkansas, some while I was still at Arkansas, some since I left and have moved on to Mississippi State and, and here at the University of Tennessee. But there are several different extension service type articles that discuss sprinkling. This again was, was work from the University of Arkansas. There are some journal article data out there too as well. This is from the Journal of Applied Engineering and Agriculture. This data also was collected at the University of Arkansas. This is from Australia. So Mark Dunlop and Jim McCauley in, in Australia, they use the same sprinkler system that I used at Mississippi State that the folks at the University of Arkansas are using. So there's getting to be a fair amount of data behind this system that is is pretty good information in terms of, of how these sprinklers can perform. 
This is in the journal Animals from last year. Jonathan Moon, who's the lead author on this, was my grad student when I was at Mississippi State. Jonathan did his master's thesis on sprinkler systems at the Mississippi State when I was working there. So there's, a, there's enough of a database out there now for anyone that's interested to have a pretty good idea of, of how sprinklers will perform. A, a lot of what sprinkling does is basically bluff those chickens, folks. We're fooling them into thinking that things are better in the chicken house than what they are. And, and when I do talks on sprinklers, I tell folks it's sprinkling is kind of like jumping in the creek after you've hauled square bales of hay all afternoon in July and August. You know, I'm not talking round bales while you just sit in the cab of the air-conditioned tractor and let the tractor do all the work. I'm talking square bales where you walk along beside the truck and throw the bales up on the truck and somebody's stacking them and then you haul it to the barn and somebody throws them off the truck and you stack them in the barn. I'm talking really work. But if you go jump in the creek after you've done this, it may be 100 degrees outside, but any breeze or wind chill effect on your wet skin fools you into thinking that it's much cooler than that when you get out of the creek. It's the same way with sprinkling chickens. Sprinkling along with cool with the fans and the wind chill effect from, from what's inside that chicken house fools those chickens into thinking that it's actually a whole lot cooler in that house and it actually is. And then once the birds have been sprinkled and they're all standing up, and a lot of them do stand up whenever they get sprinkled, water sprinkles on them, they stand up, they shake their wings, they ruffle their feathers, and they decide, I'm up, I just will go get something to eat or drink. And you do see them once they get up after they've been sprinkled, you do see a lot of birds move to the drinkers, move to the feeders. So they're, they're eating and drinking all afternoon throughout the day instead of just sitting under the air conditioner in the cool cell house where they don't get up and move around very often. So back in, let's talk about the study that we did back in 2020. And this was at Mississippi State. So we did a study to determine the effects of a sprinkler and cool cell combined system on cooling water conservation, litter moisture, and indoor house environment. So what we did, we looked at two summer flocks one went May from July, one went August through October of 2020. Mississippi State had two commercial chicken houses. It's those two chicken houses in the, in the top photo there. Those houses are 42 feet wide, 400 feet long. Those are the two houses we used. Both of them had cool cells. Both of them had sprinkler systems. So the sprinkler system combined with a cool cell in one house is what we use to compare against only a cool cell system in the other house. Now, we did flip the houses between one flock and, and the next flock. So the cool cell house on the first flock was the sprinkler house on the second flock to try to take out any house effect or anything. But basically, we had two lines of overhead sprinklers positioned above the two outside feed lines. So basically, each, water, each sprinkler line was about 10 feet off the wall. The drops were spaced evenly 20 feet apart. They were suspended seven feet above the litter in two different zones in the house. The brood half of the house was one zone. The off-end half of the house was the other zone. The way the controller was set up, the two zones could operate independently of each other. So one zone might be in one level of cooling and the other zone might be in a different level of cooling, depending on what the temperature was in each zone. Again, the sprinklers were intermittently operated by the independent sprinkler controller. Again, that little blue box did all the work. The house controller did not know that little blue box was in there, but that little blue box operated the sprinklers. And it put out control volumes of large coarse water droplets directly on the birds based on whatever level of cooling it happened to be in, depending on whatever the temperature happened to be in the house. We did not operate it the way the manufacturer recommended exactly. And the manufacturer temperature and runtime settings are in the blue table at the bottom. Our settings are in the orange table at the top. So blue table at the bottom, again, this sprinkler has three levels of cooling, one, two, and three. The way the manufacturer suggested settings were, 
level one cooling came on two degrees above whatever your tunnel temperature happened to be. Level two came on five degrees above whatever your tunnel temperature happened to be. And level three came on at eight degrees above whatever your tunnel temperature happened to be. The runtime in seconds was 10 seconds for level one, 20 seconds for level two and three. The idle time or the time in between runs was 30 minutes for level one, 15 minutes for level two, and five to seven minutes for level three. We did use their recommended runtime in seconds and their recommended idle time in minutes. We did not use their degree above tunnel temperature settings. Our temperature settings were considerably higher. So look at the orange table at the top. You know, we had a set point. Our tunnel temperature was six degrees above that set point. In our situation, level one cooling came on at 10 degrees above tunnel temperature instead of two degrees. Level two came on at three degrees above that. So 13 degrees above tunnel temperature instead of five degrees. And level three came on three degrees above that. So 16 degrees above tunnel temperature instead of eight degrees like they suggested. The cool cells in that sprinkler house did not come on until 22 degrees above tunnel temperature or 28 degrees above the set point temperature. So what that meant for us is, let's say the chickens were 56 days old. Our set point was 62 degrees. The tunnel temperature was 68 degrees. Level one of the sprinklers came on at 78 degrees. It switched to level two at 81 degrees. It switched to 80 or it switched at level three to 84 degrees. And we did not let the cool cells come on in that house until the house temperature got to 90 degrees. We figured if we could do it and make it work at 90 degrees, that everybody else could certainly make it work if they let the pool cells come on at something lower, maybe 88 or 89 degrees. So we were stressing the system and, and we, we did it on purpose. We wanted to try to make sure that if we could make it work at 90 degrees with the cool cells on held off that long, Anybody else could do it at something a little bit less than that. Now, we had to move that set point up in our house controller on the cool cells to get it to that point, but that's the way we set it up. So the days during grow outs when the cooling systems were in use for the first flock for our cool cell sprinkler combination house, we started cooling at 37 days of age with the sprinkler. And those chickens were sold at 61 days. So we went from 37 days to 61 days with sprinkler cooling. We did not even turn the cool cells on in that sprinkler cool cell combination house until the chickens were 53 days old. And then the cool cell could run from 53 to 61 days where the sprinkler had been running since day 37. From day 37 until day 53, the sprinkler did all the cooling in that house. We did not even have the cool cells on until 53 days. Over in the other house, the far column, cooling allowed in the cool cell house, we also turned it on at 37 days when we turned the sprinkler on and let it go until 61 days. Second flock, we did it a little bit differently. We started a little bit sooner at 27 to 61 days for the sprinkler and the cool cell both in the combination house. And same thing in the cool cell house. It ran from 27 to 61 days. I do not think you should turn sprinklers on before 27 or 28 days. I want the house to be reasonably filled up with chickens so that the water is sprinkling on birds and not sprinkling on the floor. You know, if you do it at two weeks, three weeks, there's still a lot of floor space there then. And a lot of the water will wind up sprinkling on the floor, but I don't want to sprinkle water on the floor. I want to sprinkle water on chickens. So what did we see? Average daily maximum house temperature and relative humidity between or when cooling was in effect. So we ran the, the cooling water. Cooling water, whether it was sprinklers or cool cells, could run from nine o'clock in the morning until nine o'clock at night. Nothing happened water cooling wise between 9 p.m. and 9 a.m. We cooled birds with water between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. So 
So let's look at temperature first. So look at the column on the left, the cool cell system. The average temperature, the average high temperature during the day was 84.8 in that cool cell house, which is pretty typical. Most folks have 83, 84 degrees in their cool cell houses. But look at the sprinkler combination house, 87.8 degrees. So it was basically 88 degrees in that sprinkler house during the day. We could get away with that, though. We could get away with that high of temperature because of what's over there in the other graph. Look at the relative humidity graph on the right. Yeah, it was 84.8 degrees in that cool cell house, so it was not all that hot, but it was 70.7% humidity, so it was very humid in that house. Now look at the sprinkler cool cell combination house. It was only 58.2% humidity. That's why we can make that higher temperature work because the humidity is enough lower that that chicken can get rid of excess body heat through panning much more efficiently at a 58% humidity than it can at a 71% humidity. Let's look at litter moisture. Again, folks think you can't sprinkle water in a chicken house because you're gonna wet the floor. You can if you manage it right. So again, we kept these chickens a long time. We kept them for 61 days. Let's look at the graph on the left first. This was in the fan end of the house when the chickens were seven weeks old when we measured the litter moisture at seven weeks. Cool cell house, 31.3% litter moisture. Combination house, 24.7% litter moisture. So a good bit drier at seven weeks. Now look at the litter moisture on the other graph over on the right. We did this one at nine weeks. We did this the day before the chickens were picked up to go to market. The cool cell house was 28.9% litter moisture. Sprinkler house, 26.9% litter moisture. Again, the litter is drier in the sprinkler house because the temperature is hotter, the humidity is lower, and it gives you a better environment inside that house. The litter is drier, and you can manage it this way if you do not panic and, and let your cool cells come on too soon. So what did we see from a water use standpoint on a daily basis? Okay, this is every day once we turn the cool cells on in that first flock. The red line is the cool cell only house. The green line is the sprinklers in the combination house. The blue line is the cool cells in the combination house. And again, you see, we did not turn those cool cells on until the chickens were 53 days old. And we see the biggest difference in water usage on the hottest days that we saw throughout the flock. So look at day 49 as an example. That green line only goes up to about 1800 liters of water went through the sprinkler system that day. But look at that red line it's up there 11,000 liters of water versus 1,800 liters of water. That's the kind of difference in savings that you can see between sprinklers and cool cells because they operate differently. They do different things. They, they, they try to do different things within that chicken house in terms of how they cool. They look at cooling differently. Second flock that summer, we basically saw the same thing. Again, the biggest difference in water usage was on the hottest days. So if you look at day 42, that sprinkler system in the combination house used around 1,000 liters of water. The cool cells did not come on at all that day. It didn't get hot enough for the cool cells to come on. But the cool cell house by itself, that red line, again, is up over 5,000 liters of water. So again, you're looking at a difference between 1,000 liters on the sprinkler system and over 5,000 liters on the cool cell system. Because again, the two systems are trying to cool in two different manners, two different ways. So how much water did we actually save? All right, if you look over there at the far right column, water saved in the combination house. For the first flock, we saved 66% of the water, the cooling water, on in that combination house versus what the sprinkler or what the cool cell house was using. 
On the second flop, the combination house saved 61% of the water over what the cool cell house was using to cool chickens. And this is pretty similar to what other people have seen at other locations. Sprinkler cooling consumed 66% less water than that used in a cool cell system in Arkansas. This is data from Lang et al. in 2014. Sprinklers consume 58% less water than a conventional cool cell in Australia. This is some of the work from Mark Dunlop and, and Macaulay in 2021. And has a national cooling water usage by broiler chickens is estimated to be roughly 825 million gallons a day. The sprinkler technology could potentially save 544.5 million gallons of water per day. This is what Lang et al. had estimated in 2020. Again, what we saw, what Jonathan Moon saw, Jonathan was my graduate student at Mississippi State working on his thesis on this. And what Jonathan saw was combine those two summer flocks together. What we saw, the sprinkler system consumed 64% less cooling water. So it doesn't make any difference where we're at, whether it's Mississippi, Arkansas, Australia, the system is very similar in terms of saving well over 50% of the cooling water that is used to keep those chickens cool. So this is some before and after sprinkling thermal camera images. These were taken with the thermal camera and it does get hot in the house. I will promise you it gets hotter in a cool cell house or it gets hotter in a sprinkler house than it does in a cool cell house. Hot enough that it will, you know, it will concern you if, if you haven't done it enough not to be so concerned because it, it is a little bit scary in the beginning. So the, the image on the left was taken just before the sprinklers came on to run in one of their cycles that afternoon. And you can see the crosshairs on that chicken's head. That spot is 101 degrees. That chicken's pretty warm. But again, the air in that house is pretty dry. The temperature is high, but the humidity is low. Now look at the graph on the, or look at the image on the right. This is just after the sprinklers have shut off in one of their cycles. So now the birds are damp. It's sprinkled a little bit of water on them. The fans are blowing. It's a tunnel house. So there's tunnel ventilation going across them. So there's air movement. So the wind chill effect is in play. The crosshairs on that chicken's head is only 90 degrees. And that's, that's why sprinklers work, because it is using a combination of low humidity and good wind chill to bluff those chickens to thinking things are not as bad as what it actually is. And it lets them do their own evaporative respiration and get rid of excess body heat quicker because the humidity in that house is lower. But again, it does require a higher house temperature and a lower humidity. If you cannot get that, if you run your spring or if you run your cool cells too much, your sprinklers will become overwhelmed and you cannot get the efficiency out of those things that you need. That combination of a higher house temperature and a lower relative humidity allows those individual chickens to do a better job of using their own evaporative respiration more effectively and more efficiently as a cooling mechanism. Sprinkler water falls on the birds and not on the litter. Again, I don't like to run sprinklers before 27, 28 days old because I don't want to sprinkle water on the floor. I want the house to be fairly well filled up with chickens so that all the water I'm sprinkling goes on chickens and not on the litter. It is important to allow those chickens to dry off in between sprinkler applications. So if they're not going to get dry in between runs and you kind of overwhelm the system and they begin to get wet and stay wet, it's not going to work near as well. They need to just about dry off because you want to use that wind chill effect to evaporate that water. And then when that water does evaporate, you want to sprinkle them again and start the whole process over again. Be aware, however, sprinkling only works if it's managed correctly. You can mess it up and it will struggle. Sprinkling will struggle if the litter is wet when you first start, if you've already lost control of your litter, if you're unwilling to accept 
that the house temperature needs to be at least 88 degrees. If you don't let the house get that warm, you're gonna have trouble making sprinklers work. Or if the house humidity is too high, by too high, I mean 75% or higher. If it gets more than that, sprinklers are gonna struggle. Or if you have lost control of the litter. If the litter is already wet, it's already caked when you get ready to start, you just well leave the sprinklers off because you're not going to be able to compensate for losing control of your litter. You're gonna to have to address litter quality before you operate the sprinklers or you're gonna have problems. A slightly higher house temperature though does mean that you've got a less humid house environment. And that's the reason sprinklers work is because the humidity is lower. I think in my opinion, that's what lets you get away with having a higher house temperature. You can justify that higher house temperature with the lower humidity. This creates a situation in that house where the birds can more effectively use their evaporative respiration and it allows water droplets from the sprinkler to be more efficiently evaporated from the surface of the bird. And through doing that, considerable cooling water savings are possible, which makes it better from an industry standpoint to be more sustainable without sacrificing the performance of your chickens. So conclusions of what we saw on, on our study at Mississippi State in 2020, the sprinkler system cool cell combination reduced cooling water use by 64% over the cool cell system alone. The sprinkler combination system did increase grower earnings. It also increased the house temperature, but it decreased house humidity and it tended to decrease litter moisture. It wasn't a significant difference, but it was a fairly good numerical difference between litter moistures with minimal effect on flock performance. So sprinklers in conjunction with cool cells can preserve broiler production and conserve cooling water if you manage them right. And it does allow for improved sustainability and reduces the poultry industry's overall environmental footprint. Now, what we did last year was, was kind of a repeat of what we did in 2020. It was the same two houses at Mississippi State. We used kind of the same format in terms of how we set the study up, that being the sprinkler house on the first flock was the cool cell house on the second flock. The biggest difference we saw was in how our integrator was, was doing the, the age of the birds that we had. Back in 2020, we kept those chickens 61 days. Last year, the inter integrator only kept them 50 days. So it was a considerably younger, smaller chicken than what it was back in 2020. But look at the feed conversion and, and the weight of, of those chickens. So for the first flock, we had a 10 point better feed conversion in the sprinkler house than we did the cool cell house. We had over a half a pound heavier chicken in the sprinkler house than we did the cool cell house. If you look at the last column where the pay is, we made over a thousand dollars more on the sprinkler house than we did the cool cell house. Can it do that every time? Absolutely not. There's no way over time it will consistently give us a 10 point better fee conversion. I'm, I'm, I'm sure of that. But look at the second flock. Same situation, only this time house two is the sprinkler house and house one is the cool cell house. Even this time, we saw four point better feed conversion in the sprinkler house, an 11 point heavier chicken, and we made what, a little over $500 more in the sprinkler house. I think this is closer to reality, folks, because this is closer to what we saw in 2020. This is closer to what the work in Arkansas shows that you can pretty much always expect two, three, four points better feed conversion and a little heavier chicken in the sprinkler house because again, it's easier for that chicken to get rid of that excess body heat. That lower house humidity is, is beneficial to that chicken. Again, it's not high temperature that kills chickens. It's high temperature and high humidity that kills chickens. So that's kind of what we saw in terms of what we looked at in 2020 and again in 2023. 
These are all my references that I used. Again, there's getting to be a, a, a pretty good database of information out there that deals with sprinklers today for anyone that's interested that wasn't really there, you know, 10 years ago. With that, you know, I would gratefully like to acknowledge the support of USDA NIFA, USDA AFRI, who helped fund this project, and Weed and Sprinkler Systems from Woodstock, Ontario, Canada, that helped make this research possible. With that, I'll say thank you. I'll try to answer any questions or comments anybody might have. Thanks, Tom. That was a great presentation, some really good information there for our producers. Uh, if you have any questions, if you would like to either put those in the chat um, or I have granted microphone privileges to participants if you would like to unmute uh, to ask any of those questions. To kick it off, one I thought of as we were going through the presentation, do you know about what the average outdoor humidity is uh, during the time you were doing these studies with the different houses? Depends on where you are. Uh... Mississippi's a little more humid than what Northwest Arkansas was because Northwest Arkansas is a little higher. You know, a, a lot of what we did when I was at Mississippi State was running outside humidity when we were, depending on what the outside temperature were. You know, and, and we did have on the, on the flock in 2023, the second flock, you know, we had the last week that those birds were in the house every day was 99 degrees or 100 higher the last week. I think 102 was the hottest day that we had, but every day the last week that we kept those chickens, 99 was the lowest temperature we saw. I think the highest was, was 102 in the afternoon. And th in those situations, outside humidity was down around 45, 50%. You know, if the outside temperature was running 90, 92 degrees, we had days when it was in the 60% humidity outside it, at Mississippi State. And it's a little more humid in Mississippi than it is in Northwest Arkansas. Northwest Arkansas is more, you know, if it's 90, 95 outside, we may be down around 50, 55% humidity outside. 